Atlanta Zone, Dana Black, coming to you live, yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Yo, we had a little technical difficulties, that's what happens sometimes, I apologize for being late, but I thank you for tuning in anyway, because I got a humdinger for you tonight, baby. But first, before I get started, uh, we got to say goodbye to a long-term, long-time Marion County Democrat who we lost the other night in Larry Ryan. If you had never had a chance to meet Larry, you missed out on something special. I remember the first time I met him and it was almost like talking to my father again. He was just that genuine and just that loving. And uh, our party lost, we lost a good one, man. We lost a soldier. And all I wanna know is, you got your dues? Do you have your South Side dues? Because that's what, that was his thing. That's what he asked people about all the time is making sure that the South Side Democrats, you know, were functioning. And so uh, a shout out to the Larry Ryan family. That is a soul that will be missed forever and ever. I'm already just crazy sad. All right, real quick. I'm going to do a quick rant, but I want to bring this young lady in because I'm telling you she's a humdinger, baby. Uh, there are some governors around, uh, uh, the Midwest region, some that are actually down on, you know, Market Street that are talking about they're ready to open the state back up. I'm sorry. I, 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 there was something I missed. When did we get adequate testing? Somebody please tell me when we were able to get adequate testing in the state of Indiana to make sure that whoever is going out in public is not infected and therefore infecting other people. I know we want to get people back to work. I get that. But we are not quite safe yet, especially when we know we, we've already heard that May is going to be the peak season for Indiana. So why would you want to open it back up before we even reached our peak and you don't even have a test yet? Y'all, don't fall for the okie doke. We will lose more lives than we will gain dollars. Trust me. And for all those nincompoops out there that had no masks on hanging out in front of the governor's mansion, for what? You mad now? I thought y'all the same people that said follow the rule of law. Whatever with that. Y'all, please be safe. Shelter in place. Don't go out unless you have to because it just ain't worth it. We're saying goodbye to too many lives every day. This is not a joke. This ain't a hoax. People are losing their lives. Be safe. All right, that's it because I'm telling you, this one right here, she was first. <laughs> Elected in 2006, and she became the first Latina elected to the Indiana House of Representatives. In 2019, Mara was elected by her peers as chair of the Indiana House Democrat Caucus, a historic caucus that is the first, for the first time in Indiana history, was a majority women caucus. Y'all give it up to my turn left guest who is now running for Congress in District 1. Y'all give it up for my girl whom I'm telling you, she a humdinger. Mara Condelaria Reardon. Yo, Mara, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. And uh, again, we, you know, we gonna, next time we interview you, we're going to have all the technical difficulties worked out. <laughs> I hope so. So you know what? I hope so. I, the region, I think, is so important, right? Um, the region is where in 2008 we were able to turn Indiana blue because the turnout was high. You are running in District 1. If you were to win this primary, which has got like 50 Democrats in it. <laughs> it's got um, 14, Dana. Oh, okay. I, I, I lost count after eight. I was like, that's too many. Um, talk about the importance of getting the folks in Lake County to turn out in 2020. I want to hit it right off the top. Well, Dana, I think that, you know, when we talk about uh, the first congressional district, we talk about a seat that has not been vacant for 30 years. And so it's of utmost importance. And we've seen we've seen just in the last you know month or so, we've seen how very important it is, the kinds of leaders that we send to the United States Congress. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you've been doing this thing for a long time. You've been doing community service for a long time, but tell the people who you are and where you come from. So, um, Dana, I am a, a Latina woman, as you said. I am half Mexican and half Puerto Rican. I was raised by um, a Mexican-American mother born in the United States, a, a first generation born here. 
Um, my father uh, came from Puerto Rico. Um, uh, after serving in the military, he settled in Northwest Indiana. He is, um, he was a probation officer. My mother was a teacher and president of the Indiana Federation of Teachers. Okay. So Dana, I come from a family of firsts. My mother was the first Latina elected to a statewide uh, federation of teachers. My father was the first Puerto Rican city councilman in the city of East Chicago to be appointed. Wow. So, um, you know, when I became elected in 2006, I also became the first Latina elected to the General Assembly. So um, my parents were always very engaged in the community. They were community activists. They connected for us at a very early age that um, the policies that govern us and how they affect communities and particularly our own community. We were not only expected to uh, be engaged in in bettering our community, but uh, in you know engaging in a in a discussion of public policy. We had to defend our positions. We could have any position we wanted, but we had to defend our position. My parents uh, in the 1960s were involved in building Resurrection City. Um, a shanty town that was built across the street from the White House in the in the 1960s to bring light uh, the people living in bring to light the people living in poverty in the United States, and um, it was called the War on Pop um, the War on Poverty. Okay, we're still and, fighting that uh, one. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the 70s, uh, my parents fought very very hard for the Equal Rights Amendment, which you know. We need now more than ever for not only women, but for our LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ community. Um, so those are battles that my parents fought very early of the grape boycott. I can remember certainly a decade of my life where I didn't eat grapes because of the way that the farm workers were treated. And uh, those are the kinds of things that I learned how to defend and engage in when I was very young. Um, my parents also fought in the, you know, in the 80s and 90s against the dumping of foreign steel that was decimating our, our steel industry here in the United States, continues to be a problem today. Um, these, are the, these are the things that shaped my life and shaped um, my desire to be in, in public office and to serve the public. You know what? That is a rich, rich history. And it sounds like community service is just a part of who you are based on your upbringing. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Were you a product of public schools? I am. I went to Catholic school through eighth grade, uh, high school, public schools. Okay. Now, you know, one of the things that we always hear, and I, and I, and I try my best to make sure that, you know, turn left is not necessarily indie centric. A lot of the sure. folks in the region feel like Indianapolis ignores them. Well, Dana, we're seeing it right now, this very moment, with this COVID-19 crisis. What? Indianapolis has two times the population that Lake County has, yet they have four times the tests that we have. It's unacceptable that this governor believes that he can open up the state, even partially, without getting that accurate count of who is sick and who is not. We are not asking for, you know, anything that Marion County doesn't already have. We have frontline workers only being tested right now in Lake County, and it's just not enough. We have communities of color in the northern part of our district in, in Hammond, Gary, and East Chicago that are dying at an alarming rate. If we had the appropriate testing, we wouldn't be, com we wouldn't be complaining to the governor about opening up this state. Mm. And, uh, ooh, and see, I've heard it uh, not just in, you know, the, well, the, you know, the virus brings everything to light, right? You know, all the other problems that we know we've seen this virus is bringing to light. Why do you think that Lake County just, I mean, not just Lake County, the entire region, Porter County, LaPorte County, you know, why is it that we haven't really made that connection? We got to do better. Well, we have to do better. But Dana, ask yourself and, you know, ask yourself why. You know, Indianapolis takes care of Indianapolis because it's the capital. Indianapolis, I have to say, what is the thing that makes you Lake County unique to the state of Indiana? It's a Democrat county. Right, right, right. Just yeah. So ask yourself, is it because we have a majority of Democrats here? I would hate to think that, but that's what seems to be 
happening here? Well, you know, I, my goal is to not ignore any area. I want to make sure that I talk to people from all nine congressional districts because I think it's just way too important. And and to me, it just seems like, you know, the region and District 1 is so pivotal in how we win and turn Indiana blue. So that's why I'm so glad that you came on the show. So let's talk about why you decided to run for Congress. I mean, you could you, you could have stayed in the state house. You decided to make have. the leap. Talk about that. I, I could have, Dana, and uh, when I saw the field of candidates and I looked at myself, I could not in good conscience uh, not run. I, am, I bring a unique skill set to the table. I am a legislator. This is a legislative job. I don't have to tell people the kind of congressman or kind of lawmaker that I'm going to be because they can see it in my voting record. I have taken those fights on. I have been fighting for access to health care. I have been fighting for raising our minimum wage in Indiana. I have been fighting for all of the things that are important to Hoosiers. And I think that I could not in good conscience not get into this race. And I'm putting everything on the line here. As you said, I could be fat and sassy in the state house for another 20 years if I wanted to. But I put my seat, I put my leadership post on the line for this because that's how much I believe that I would be the best congresswoman in this field of candidates. So, you know, the issues that we face here in the state and that you guys fight in the state house are somewhat similar, <clears throat> excuse me, but very different when you get to the DC level. And it's, it's more about collaboration and it's more about, you know, getting that cohesion in Indiana. You just hope that your bill gets heard with that super majority. Talk about your leadership style and how you plan on working across the aisle to get some of the, the things that you want to see happen in Congress to filter down to Indiana. Sure. So Dana, I have been working in um, I have been working on in a collaborative environment my entire career. So I've had the unique position of being in the majority when I was first elected and in the minority for the for the rest of my career. Okay. And so I know what it is to work across the aisle. Only in my sophomore term, I was able to get a $14 million appropriation for a federal project that was languishing for over 30 years. When we got a $14 million appropriation to uh, finish the Little Calumet River uh, levee structure. Okay. And not only finish it, but find a funding mechanism by which it could be maintained. In a multi-jurisdictional project like that federal project was, it was very difficult for people to understand. Well, it was built, okay, here's the project. Over those 30 years, nobody talked about maintaining it. So when we started the project on the, you know, on the, um, on the east end of the river and moved towards the state line on the west, there were culverts and things that had not been looked at in those 30 years since it was since it was started. There were trees, there were, all of those things caused a devastating flood in the community of Munster that I represent. Over 6,000 businesses and homes were displaced. I had to go to the General Assembly and convince 149 other people in both chambers why it was important that we allocated $14 million. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't know how to work across the aisle and in a collaborative environment. It's building those relationships, right? Absolutely. When I first got to the General Assembly, there were, there were you know, the Republican events and the Democrat events. And because, my, because of my um, relationship with uh, a, a colleague of mine, Sean Eberhardt and I, I would go to his things, he would go to my things, and now everybody goes to everybody's things. It's about getting to know people and, and, and really meeting them where they are. Mm -hmm. I think that people don't know what the challenge is. They hear about corruption and they hear about the, you know, um, things that are not flattering to Northwest Indiana throughout this mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And one of my objectives as a legislator was to paint a different picture of Northwest Indiana and let them know who we really are. We're hard working blue collar folks in Northwest Indiana. And we're not all, we're not all, um, corrupt. No. One of my goals as an elected official was to be above reproach and to bring that view and that that integrity from Northwest Indiana back down to the state house and change people's perspective of who we are and 
what we do up here in Lake County. You know, I think integrity um, <laughs> is a word that, that is not used often enough. Um, I don't think people, mm, w one of the things I say, especially when I look at our governor and the current person that's occupying the White House, is that they are elected officials, but they're not leaders. And to me, when you are an elected official, and your job is to look out for the constituents that you are elected to represent. And when I see people like the current governor willing to risk lives to open businesses up, I question integrity. Because, and, and somebody, somebody's going to be like, Dana, you're going way too far on that one. And you don't have to agree with me on that one. And I, I wouldn't want to put you in that spot. But for, to me, it's like, if you're not doing whatever you can to keep the citizens of this state healthy, first and foremost, then, then, and then something else is motivating you to do something that's going to put people in harm's way, I question your integrity. And I don't like it when people, you know, sometimes like share one thing, but it's really something else. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's so important sure. anymore, especially when we're, we're talking. I mean, we've got to change. We're politicians, right? So the only way we can change that perception is to be the politician that we say we want, right? That's right. That's right. And that's what I've tried to do throughout my career. I've tried to be that person of my word. When somebody asks me, will I support a bill? Will I vote on a bill? You know, when I have all the information and I can make an informed decision, that's when I tell you whether I'm going to support it or not. I'm not going to tell you without doing my due diligence. I think it's really important. That's all you have in this world is your word yeah. in this process. And this legislative process is all, all you have is your word. And, um, and that's something that I have not ever taken very lightly. I don't give anybody my vote or my position until I have done my due diligence because I don't think that's fair to our constituents for the state of Indiana. When you talk about integrity, Dana, I think that, you know, um, it, it is important to have integrity and that's what your word brings is integrity. And there's nobody in this state house that, ha that, that can ever say that I have not been a person of my word. And that's what we need in the federal government. I mean, because, uh, we are seeing, you know, we're witnessing, you know, false truths. You know, they want to call it fake news, but whenever you're lying to the people, I mean, and I'm, and I'm specifically talking about one person. So let's, I'll just put that like that because, you know, I, I talk to Congressman Carson all the time and he's like, nah, Dana, they all right. But, but sometimes the policies they introduce are, are what the issues are. I'm sure they're nice people, but it's the policies that, 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 that worry me. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's very difficult for me when uh, some of when I see for, you know, some of my colleagues be, being photographed with teachers on Red for Ed Day, yet they vote consistently against teacher pay. They vote consistently against, against uh, public education. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that, you know, you have to get past the, you have to get past the who would you like to have a beer with and who is actually looking out for you. Absolutely. And Betsy DeVos, mm, she, she is a pain in my, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, when you talk about education and how important it is, it's almost like um, we are interested in dumbing down our entire society to the point where we don't believe science anymore. We actually ridicule intelligence. I, I'm trying to figure out how we got there. Oh, we did that on purpose by defunding public education and not offering um, the best possibilities for every child. And when you're not focused in on the vast majority of, of, of students who go to public schools and you keep taking money, because this is, what did this virus do? It showed well, it's a pie, Dana. Oh, it's yeah. a pie. Yeah. And the more people you invite to have a piece of the pie, the smaller everybody's piece is going to be. If you want to have public charter schools, as they're called, then fund all of the schools adequately. You cannot take six hundred million dollars out of public education, in you know, and take that money and never give it back and say you're increasing incrementally. It doesn't work like that. And so, you know, I think we really have to, you know, hold people accountable. You Absolutely. know, we've got a candidate in this. We've got a candidate in this race, who clo whose whose city has closed five public schools. That's right, in the city of Hammond. Five public schools have been closed, yet public dollars were used to build a charter school in Hammond. Tell hmm. me if that makes sense. Hmm. That, that's the kind of that's the kind of leadership we don't need in so, Congress. So, so 
Uh, I, so I'm gonna be real honest with you. My my show is always about love, so we gonna keep it we gonna keep it about Mara, right? We gonna keep it about Mara, all right? So I, you, I see how I skated out of that, right? You see how I skated. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that you'll be able to have a, a huge impact on when you get to, to Congress is how the nation addresses our climate change issue. Um, in Indiana, we already see that you know there were bills, you know, to to keep it make it impossible for coal plants to stay open. Um, and and again, 45 came out to- which, to, I, which I voted for. You voted for it. I voted for the bill to not allow uh, okay. the yeah. coal plants okay. to continue to operate. Okay, yes. okay. I, I, voted for, I voted for the bill that, that allowed, I voted against the bill, I'm sorry, that allowed um, coal, that allowed the coal plants to not be governed by the IURC. Right, right. Because the whole the whole point of the bill was don't close the coal plant till you talk to us first, because we may not want you to close it. And so right. that was a horrible. And you're saying you vo- and you voted against it. But here you I had, voted against yeah. it. Yeah. So here is uh, you know 45 talking about he wants to rescue the coal industry. Talk about how asinine that actually is, especially when small businesses, they ran out of money for small businesses, and then he wants to continue to save a dying industry. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that that I've talked about during this campaign is that um, I really believe that we, our climate is in crisis. It is scientific. It's science, right? We Mm -hmm. talked about science. It's science. Um, Our climate is in crisis. I believe that we can continue we can encourage investment in green technology i believe in the entrepreneurial spirit of the united states i believe that this is a problem that we can solve with within the united states and within the world we have you know working with our partners in the world i truly believe that i think that you know just the way you know we did you know we saw you know, economic booms with, uh, you know, the, with rural electrification and, um, and broadband expansion and, you know, green technology will expand and continue to grow our economy. We have to invest and encourage investment in it. Okay. And let's just, let's go on and hit the, the big one out the box. Talk about health care, and, and I know that your constituents have, have, have talked to you about it when you're, before we were on lockdown, you were out canvassing, and you probably made phone calls. Talk to me Absolutely. about what your constituents are saying when it comes to health care. Look, people are tired of, of, you know, pharmaceutical companies jacking up drug prices. I mean, we've seen during this, during this pandemic, companies, you know, are states capping the prices of insulin, things that we've been trying to do in this state things that we've been trying to encourage and do and mandate. And, uh, you know, so it, those are the kinds of things that they're tired of, you know, that they're tired of, of paying, overpaying for prescription medications that, that they need to live. Mm-hmm. People should not have to decide whether to buy their medications or to buy food. It's oh. not a decision that people should have to make. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, when I was, um, when I was, you know, in the legislature, I took as a legislator, I've taken a vote to uh, to uh, fund the Healthy Indiana Plan through a cigarette tax, providing 400,000 Hoosiers, additional Hoosiers with health care through the Healthy Indiana Plan. Those are the things, the real things that I've done as a legislator and that I will continue to advocate for as your congresswoman for the first district. Absolutely. And I apologize because they're uh, mowing the lawn all of a sudden at a quarter to seven at night. I apologize, y'all, for the lawn more. So, you know, every candidate has that that one or two things that they really want to tackle when they assume the role. Talk about the, the bills or the, the um, legislation that you want to introduce, even though you're going to be a rookie way in the back. You know, because you're, you know, you, you're, you're following the footsteps of, of, of Representative uh, Veslowski, but talk about those couple of first bills that you want to see, you know, gosh, can I get these uh, in a committee? Can I get these on the floor for a vote? So a lot of what I've done as a legislator has been in the fiscal realm. And so uh, the system is a little bit different, I think. And one of the things that, one of the things that I would like to continue to push for 
uh, that's vital to my community is the expansion and double tracking of the South Shore. We are in the queue. It's a matter of getting ourselves over the line. Okay. And I think we put all the pieces in place here at the state level and at the local level. And I think that's a definite priority for me to ensure that that continues. I mean, that will put, you know, that'll put union workers to work for 10 years. Wow. I mean, that's a project that we have got to continue to push forward in the federal, in the, you know, in the federal process. Absolutely. And you know what? I, I always question why they allowed um, so many parts of Lake Michigan to be walled off when that, I mean, tourism, everybody knows if you have a, a great lakefront, Chicago, you, you can attract people. One of the, it just breaks my heart every time I drive up Broadway sure. in Gary. And, and I'm like, at the end of Broadway, there's that damn steel mill. Now, and obviously, it's been there a long time. But it just breaks my heart. Probably 100 years, Dana. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was, I was, I was going to say 100. Well, but I, I mean, and, it, and if you, you know, one of the things, I took this fantastic class when I was in college with um, Mark Rushkin, who was a, an environmental scientist in Northwest Indiana, just a conservationist, an amazing individual. And uh, uh, he talked about, you know, um, the unique ecosystem that we have in, in, in Lake County and in Porter County with the, the Indiana Dunes and, and how we need to protect that. And that was the first time, and I was in college, mind you, that was the first that was only, time. That was only, what, five years ago? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was in college. And so, that was really the first time in my 20s that I was so inspired by the unique ecosystem that we have. The Indiana Dunes, people come from all over the world mm -hmm. to study the unique ecosystem that we have in the Indiana Dunes. And so absolutely, we need to continue to encourage that, that um, tourism and the protection of our national lakeshore now a national park mm -hmm. and um you know that's visited by millions of people every year and is an economic boom now we'll we're never going to be able to reclaim u.s steel right we're not. never going to be able to claim reclaim you know the steel making process takes water mm -hmm. and that's why it was put on lake michigan you know and mm -hmm. so um but one interesting thing i learned in rushkin's class was that our sand from the Indiana Dunes was trucked to Chicago. That beach, Oak Street Beach, mm -hmm. North Avenue Beach, mm -hmm. that's all Indiana sand. Hey. They created that beach with that's, Indiana sand. You know, a lot of good stuff comes from Indiana because uh, I tell you what, the Indiana limestone is everywhere down in, you know, southern Indiana. So, you know, apparently we have the resources. You know, we just have to get people to stop treating our state like a trash can. Well, we have to we have to stop treating ourselves that way too. Absolutely, and we and, we and, have to and, stop treating ourselves. Like I said, that was a moment for me, an eye opening moment in Mark Reshkin's class, that taught me what the value of our of our unique ecosystem is. I didn't know that. That's not something that I learned. I went to, uh, I went to uh, high school, you know, Munster High School, and one of the top high schools in the nation. And I didn't know that about mm. Northwest Indiana, Absolutely. that people come to study it from all over the world because there, there's plant life and unique, you know, insect life and things that are here that, that are nowhere else in the world. You know, one of, the, one of the things that actually changed me when I ran four years ago against uh, the Speaker of the House um, was when I, when I started running, I was an angry lesbian about uh, RIFRA. Right. I was mad and I saw all the shenanigans he had pulled to get this bill to the, the governor's desk to sign. But what changed me as a candidate was learning about the contaminated soil that children were living in in Calumet. And it had obviously I lived in the, the area that the speaker lived in. It didn't necessarily impact me directly, but it impacted my spirit because here we had the government the federal government, the state government, and even in some cases the local government that knew that this, this soil was tainted and these children um, were, were becoming ill. Not only that, Dana, they, it's not the only that they knew that that soil was contaminated. They built a housing project they built a house. on top of that contaminated soil purposefully. Yeah. What happened there was criminal. Yeah. Criminal. Yeah. And it but it changed me, right? It, it, was the, it was the thing that said, okay, 
you know, I can't just be about this one issue. There are so many issues in the state of Indiana that require someone's attention. And I feel like you, you're already there. Like, you know, you may have, you, you, when your parents are raising you up and you, you had to have an argument for whatever that thing was, you are already there as a politician who understands the nuances of things. And I believe that that might be one of the areas that would, ma would make you an amazing congressman. But, but t talk about how that was developed. I mean, outside of the parenting and the schooling, is there something just in you that says, you know what, no, nah, we got to look at this differently? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it was. You know, my mother was a teacher, and, um, and my father, you know, like I said, was a probation officer, and they had very, they had very different perspectives. They weren't always, my father was, you know, um, much, my father was more conservative probably than my mother, um, and so, you know, there was already a difference in the way they, they viewed things, right? Mm -hmm. And so they allowed me and sort of shaped me to be able to have a, a civil discourse, they, you know, between them about issues that they didn't agree on mm -hmm. and to see that civil discourse and the examples that they set for me in having to be able to work in a collaborative environment. You cannot be a bomb thrower if you want people to get things done. If you want people to understand your point of view, you have to meet them where they are. You know, Dana, I didn't know what a CAFO was when I got to the General Assembly. Mm. Do you know what that I is? I have no idea. <laughs> Educate, turn left listeners it now. It is a confined animal feeding operation. Oh, yeah. What it is pigs? essentially. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's essentially a pig pen where yeah. animals eat and relieve themselves uh -huh. all in the same place. And so those, those, um, those operations need regulation. Yeah. They need parameters. There's groundwater that is affected. There's air quality issues. Those are all issues that I didn't know about before I became a state representative. But because they were important to my colleagues, I educated myself mm -hmm. and they educated mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. on what those, how those things impacted their community. That's you have to meet people where they are. Subsequently, I'm one of the few Democrats that is endorsed by the Farm Bureau. Oh, that's impressive. So, I mean, I've been endorsed regularly by the Farm Bureau because I took the time to understand what their issues are. I only have three working farms in my district, and they are very small farms. They're not, you know, huge farms mm -hmm. or anything, but they're still, you know, have issues that are important to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I have to make sure that I understand all of those things, my community. And I think one of the things that made me a great, makes me a great legislator Come on now. and will make me a great Congresswoman is the diversity of my district. I have everything from an urban core all the way to rural Indiana to uh, gated communities. And I've worked on all of their issues as a legislator in the general assembly. So I'm prepared. I'm ready on day one. That's what's up. So you ready on day one. Now talk about what it'll mean to be the only Latina we have ever sent to Congress. Well, Dana, I've usually been the only wherever I go. When I went to college, I, know I, went, to college, <laughs> I went to college at uh, Barra College in Lake Forest, Illinois. I went there and when I got, when I was getting ready to go to college, my mother said, you're probably going to only be the only Latina there. And if there are other Latinos, they're probably going to be, you know, uh, doing, uh, doing, you know, landscaping or working in the kitchen. And I want you to know that but for education, you would be on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. So take this opportunity, accept how lucky and privileged you are and treat them with the respect that you would have want your grandfather who came to this country here with nothing to be treated. That's what's up. And you know what? Come on now. Being a woman of color, you know, we, we saw what they did to the squad and how they tried, you know, we saw how people were disparaging and, and they always telling people of color, especially us women of color, you know, to get in line, stand in line and behave. Uh, Dana, you know, <laughs> let me tell you this. You know that if I were a man running for this office with the experience that I have, 
there would be nobody saying this is not this is the front runner i would be the front runner i would be the, the shoe in for this office i would be unquestioned mm -hmm. It, I'm questioned. It, it's harder for us as women, and especially women of color. And we, and you know, honestly, with only 23% of our elected officials nationwide being women, we need more women representing us. I'm not endorsing anyone in District One, but I'm just saying, if we can get more women elected, we would. I mean, the conversation changes every time we elect more women. I'm Absolutely, just, and yeah. we bring a unique perspective. We bring a unique perspective. We bring a unique skill set of problem solving. And it's not that, you know, it's, I think it's not about, you know, necessarily about, you know, because when I talk about uh, gender, people get upset because now we, you know, we, we have, you know, non-binary, we, we have to, you know, <laughs> our, our LGBTQ um, brothers and sisters. But the truth of the matter is that we bring a different perspective. When I got to the General Assembly, I was told that, you know, I was offered, you know, the Family and Social Services Committee and the Education Committee. And, and those things are important. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I think they're extremely important. But those are seen as the women committees, right? I wanted to be on the money committee. And oh. that's where I went. I went to Ways and Means. Okay. And so I still got to work on family and so social services committee issues and still got to work on education issues, but I also got to run with the big boys and follow where the money is. Absolutely. That's, that's what we have to, you know, that's, that's where you want to be. Absolutely. Because we want to be in a position to create change. And so what does it talk about? What does it mean to, you know, be that role model? Because again, you're the, you were, you were the only Latina elected at the time. We've had, a, you know, more since. Not not a whole lot more. Let's just keep that real. Not a whole lot more. I think it was you and Christina and, and uh, Ed Harris. Earl. Earl Harris. I'm sorry. What did I say? Yeah. Ed Harris is an actor, right? Right. <laughs> um, we've had a couple. I would have liked to serve with him, too. Okay. <laughs> but, but I think, talk about what it is to be that role model um, for, for young girls who, you know, who are Latina, who, you know, didn't think they would have that opportunity, and they see you running for office, and what does that mean to you? You know, Dana, it's an incredible responsibility to be the first, but I was the first in 2006. It's 2020. It's time. It is time. I, I, it is time for more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have, um, so one of the things that I did when I first got to the General Assembly, there was not um, anybody. I looked around. I looked in the hallway. I looked in the state house. I looked in the chamber. There was nobody that looked like me. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was a few years uh, later that Christina came, but you know, there was nobody that looked like me. So I decided that I wanted to give people, you know, our kids, our Latino kids, an opportunity to come to the state house and see what it is we do at the state house. So I started something called the Latino Fellows Program. And the Latino Fellows Program is a program where we invite every school in Indiana to send us five kids for a full day of activities. They do a mock session. They get a um, financial aid workshop. They get to hear from me and um, state representatives uh, that are Latino. Mm -hmm. They get to um, get a tour of the Capitol. They get to meet the governor if he's in residence. Okay. When okay. do our kids get to meet the governor? Yeah, yeah. doesn't Never. happen. It does not so, happen. So um, it started out, it was maybe... 10 kids from Gavitt High School that came down and only because their counselor was my son's swimming instructor during the summer. Mm. And so she, I contacted her and she brought the kids down. They came down in a van. In fact, they didn't even have the money for gas to get back. Wow. Unless their teacher was going to pay for it. So I paid for it and it started out with 15 kids. We were at 185 kids this year, Dana, from so all sad. over the state, like 17 counties represented. It was a beautiful thing to see all those young and eager faces in the state house, just, you know, full of questions for their elected officials, full of questions. It was incredible and such a, an honor to see that program grow. And um, so in 2016, I want to say, I was looking for a campaign manager. And so I told the state party, I got some resumes from the state party. I was 
super excited to, um, you know, be running again. You know, I had lost in 2016 and I had to pick myself up and dust myself off and run again. So I'm looking for a campaign manager. I get some resumes from the state party and um, I get this resume. I, I was really insistent that I wanted somebody from the region. Mm -hmm. And so I get this resume and this young lady, I call her on the phone and she says to me, you probably don't remember me, but you brought me to the state house when I was a sophomore in high school. I said, right that moment, I said, you are hired. <laughs> she has gone, she has gone from being a lobby intern in the hallway to being a staff assistant to being a legislative assistant. And now she's the caucus chair assistant. Wow. So she is amazing. Her name is Samantha Lozano and uh, she got to plan when she, her first year, she got to plan the Legislative Latino Fellows Program. That's what's And up. it was exciting to see her vision and her vision continues to grow for the program. We're in the process of establishing a 501c3 so that we can monitor the kids, start a scholarship program for them, and just continue to grow the program and bring kids to the state house so that they can work. And, and we talk to them about, you know, everything. We expose them to a lobbyist. They hear from a lobbyist. They hear from their legislators. They hear from somebody from state government so that they, uh, they do a mock session. So they know, you know, that there's a role for everybody. Not everybody wants to be elected to office, but a lot of people want to be engaged in their government. And so it provides them a path and an opportunity to do that, whether it's in state government or the political realm of running campaigns or, or actual, you know, running for office. There's a role for everybody to play in government. And it's not always an, as an elected official, but if they're not exposed they're never going, they can't aspire to something that they don't even know exists. Absolutely. And so my job, you know, my goal with this program was really to ensure that we expose our children. And it was so funny, Dana, they had some questions for the governor. There's this one kid, I'll never forget, this kid, Mat Matias. He raised his hand, he was in the back of the stairs when we were, they were all assembled for a picture with the governor. And he uh, raised his hand and he said, Governor, Governor, I have a question. And he said, what is it? You know, he said, I said, come on down, Matias. And he said, would you endorse me for my sophomore? Would you endorse me for my sophomore class president? There you go. Might as well so, ask. Um, the governor took a selfie with him and said, however you use it is your business. Wow. Now, see, okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you, they, they don't get that. And one of the yeah. things, and I know that you ran against the speaker, and that's why I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, relationships and we talk about, you know, uh, how policy often doesn't reflect the people, you know, mm -hmm. I have to say that the speaker was very kind to my kids. He mm -hmm. would bring them up to the rostrum and talk to them about the legislative process and about the, you know, the procedures that, that we were going through on the calendar and those things and always very gracious. That is not an opportunity that my kids from East Chicago, Hammond, Gary are going to get. Right, right. I didn't provide it for them. He just didn't like gay people. <laughs> he just didn't like gay people. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> he liked Latinas as long as they were straight. No. <laughs> I'm being, I'm being facetious, but you know that Riffra bill was terrible. But anyway, uh, you know what? The Riffra bill was ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we, that, that's girl. That was the, that was the, uh, you know, the kick in the pants. Like, come on. But uh, you know what? That's what I love to hear, right? I love to hear about how you're leaving the ladder down and how you're, you've created a legacy. And see, to me, those are the most important things when it comes to who we're electing. As Democrats, we're pretty much on the same side, relatively, right? With a few modifications here and there, but we're really on the same side when it comes to certain policies. And that's why I work hard to elect Democrats from all over. But when you have shown a consistency in making sure that you're bringing up the next one behind you, that speaks volumes about who, what your character is because you don't, yeah, you may have been the first, but you don't want to be the only one. No. You just don't want to be. And to me, that speaks volumes. And if, if people don't take anything else away from this conversation, I hope they take away the fact that you gave kids who normally would not have ever, 
ever had any intimacy with our, our state government, you created an opportunity, and it's an ongoing thing. And I hope every Lat it, now it's 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 for the Latino community. I hope you guys reach out to it, get your kids involved, because it sounds like it's fantastic. And I want to. It it's a great. It's a great. We even give them a little sweatshirt, right, with the, with a logo on it, so that they're proud Absolutely. and that they understand that they were selected as fellows. For, for this program and so you know um it's my goal to make it you know to continue it's going to continue you know this was my last session as a legislator mm -hmm. at the state house this was my last session yeah, yeah. and so it was a little bittersweet um leaving the latino fellows program that day because it's such it's such it's my baby and it's been such an honor to see, you know, to see the light bulbs go off yeah. and to see the eagerness to learn and yeah. to see, you know, some of our kids don't leave their four block radius. Yeah. yeah. And so to have them come down to the state house and see that there's a whole brave world out there that they have access to. Absolutely. You know, it's very important. I know that uh, now I don't even know how my mother managed to make this happen, but I ended up being a page for, for uh, J Congressman Julia Carson when she was at the state house. And I don't even know how I don't even know how she did it, but I was one of those kids that got to go to the state house at about 12, 14 years old or whatever yep. it was, and be a page. And now look at me, I'm a it I talker know. on I'm an it, it talker changed, on Facebook. And it changed your life. It did. And that's what I'm trying to do yeah. is change lives. You're you doing should it. See their faces when I say to them, "I work for you. Yeah. Don't feel any. You know, don't feel that you can't ask me questions." or your representatives because you're our bosses. Absolutely. We work for you. Absolutely. It's I not the it. other way around. I we love work it. for you. Mar, you got a lot of passion too, sister girl. I love that. But I knew that. I knew you were a firebrand. <laughs> I told the people when we got started. And I've always enjoyed talking to you and hanging out with you at French Lick and 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 you and Matt and just doing all the fun stuff because you are a, a first of all, you're just a cool lady. You know what I'm saying? Well, Real thank talk. You. You're just a cool lady. You know, you got a, t a tough race, so go ahead and tell the people where they can, if, they, if you like what she's talking about, listen in. Tell the people where they can find you so they can donate to your campaign, become a volunteer, and possibly vote for you. Absolutely. We can be found at maraforindiana.com. We um, welcome volunteers. We welcome, always welcome cash. <laughs> races are expensive. Honey. But, you know, we, we would just love for you to join our team. All right. Y'all, Indiana's on Dana Black talking to Mara kind of I can never get the middle name. K say it for me. It's phonetic. So oh, look at it. Candelaria. Candelaria. Candelaria Reardon. Okay. If y'all like yep. what she's what Miss Mara is talking about, y'all join her team. She is running for Congress in District One. Again, there are 14 Democrats that are running in that race. Here is one of them for you, a Latina sister who is bringing the funk. She's bringing passion. She is not going to be passive when you send her, if you send her to Washington District 1. Y'all, thank y'all so much for tuning in to, to Turn Left. This is why I love doing this. I didn't even know that she had spearheaded that project, so now I'm all excited about, hmm, I wonder what I can do. <laughs> that's what you do. You motivate people to want to do better, and that's, that's important. Y'all, Indiana's on Dana Black. All right, tomorrow I will be chatting with another congressional candidate from the 9th District, the last one. I think I got everybody but Brandon. No, Andy Ruff. I haven't gotten him either. So I'm talking to Brandon tomorrow night. So tune in. And then, of course, you know we always got two guests on Thursday because Thursday's turn left night where we really go in on Republicans because they deserve it because <laughs> they do dumb stuff. Um, but yo, this is why we do this to bring you content and the people who are running for office. And if she speaks to you and you want to support her, find her, support her because Hey, we, we, we sure because say Dana, huh? I'm the only legislator in this race. The only one with experience. Only so one thank with experience. you for having me. Not a problem. Hey, Indiana's on Dana Black turn left specials. We will catch y'all tomorrow night. Mara, thank you, baby. Talk to you next time. Hey, bye-bye. Bye-bye.